would turn to number 47. Let's sing together, praise him, praise him. the Lord. Your singing was inspired.
the things is that your director didn't let you drag and that you resisted the old temptation. See, this song, if it's not sung in the spirit and up to tempo, it doesn't do us too good. It's, uh, that's why people wear it. And they get a thing in their mind. You know how we are with Sunday school? A lot of you have negative attitude because of background. And we're having a time trying to get it out of you. See, we're offering to throw guineas in the streams and knock out windows and do everything we can. But to get a certain attitude, deposit attitude in your mind. But when hymns are sung right, sung in the Spirit, singing the joy of the Lord, then our children don't get these attitudes when they grow up. They get, they're filled with joy. See, there's a laziness. There's a laziness in people. That's why the, the old hymns of the church are, are remembered as being dragging. Oh, you don't want to sing that one because you heard it so many times out of the Spirit. But the, the fellows pray about these songs, and if we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, we have victory in God. They, they need never, they need never remember uh, negative things about church. You see, this is so important. This is so wonderful. I really want to thank God because you've inspired my soul in these songs tonight. The, the marvel is that our hymn singing here and our gospel song singing has been encouraging and lifting most of the time. Been very little drag. And I really, really thank God for it. Let's stand for prayer as Jim White leads us in prayer. There's a microphone on the floor down there. Thank you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Thank you. Dear Jesus. It's on, Jim. Dear Jesus, we're thankful for a time that we can come here and gather and sing praises unto thy name. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor. We pray that you'll be with him, that you'll help him, Jesus, strengthen sure him, you'll need. undergird him, Lord. We lift him up to thee, God. We know that he needs help and we pray for him daily. We pray, God, that you'll be with the choir they sing tonight. May they sing praises to thee. May, God, that each thing said and done here tonight be for thy honor and for thy glory. And may you receive all the blessings that comes out of this place tonight. We pray the Holy Spirit might abound in each thing that's said and done. We pray, God, that you'll be with us. Forgive us for the things we do wrong. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
got a privilege tonight that very few girls ever get a chance to have, and I'm real thankful that I can stand up here and, and do it. It's, it's an honor. But my parents and Barry's parents would invite all of you all to our wedding Friday night at 7 o'clock and here in the sanctuary. And we'd like for everybody to come because it's a special time for us and it's for the kingdom and it's for the Lord's work. And there will be a reception following. Okay, that's out of the way. <laughs> hey, hey. I want to say that their, their wedding uh, promises to be a true worship service. Uh, when the senior, the sanctuary choir is to sing Beethoven's Hallelujah, and uh, the uh, the girls from Sound of Music, the nuns, are to do Hallelujah. And I know we'd like to surprise them, but I, what I wanted to say was, we got a worship service coming here, folks, and uh, I'm kind of thrilled about it. Uh, I'm very thrilled about it. So I thought, well, let's come to church Friday night, not just for a wedding. But let's come to worship God, which is the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to worship God. Really, that's the church what's supposed to take place. Rodney gave me an announcement. It says, registration and re-enrollment fees are now due for Taze Valley Christian School. Re-enrollment fees should be paid by the end of July. First month tuition is due August 1st. If you need re-enrollment forms, you may get them from Pastor Rod or at the window of the receptionist's office after this service or any time throughout the week. And this next announcement, I was told, is very, very important for the men. It's, they told me, well, Jim told Rodney to get me up on the podium and jump up and down and make it. And there's nothing here to get up on here with, so I'm not going to, but it's that important. We need all the men with shovels, picks, and mattocks here at 8 o'clock Saturday morning, sharp. Not late, but bring your stuff and be here. It's to work on the sewage system, I guess. So we really, it's important. So let's turn out and be faithful even in that. Amen. Uh, youth, if you are going to see the Hatfields and McCoys on the 24th you need, and you haven't seen CG, see him tonight and give him your name because re the, we're going to call in tomorrow to make reservations. Don't forget youth camp, August the 4th through the 11th. And adult choir, please be here in your place at 6.30 Friday night. And the youth choir girls, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, be here for practice on the music. And you can get the words to the music from Vicki Hill if you need to go over it and so you'll know the words. And if the ushers will come forward, the offering tonight will be for the sewage system just as it was last week. Let's really dig down deep and really give to the Lord and let it be for Him. Eric, would you pray, please? Jesus, we want to thank you for this evening, Lord. Thank you for this nice, cool place we can be in, Jesus, for the air conditioners working, Jesus. We want to pray, Lord, that you would be in the rest of the service to follow, Lord, and you would bless and sanctify this offering, Lord, for your use. Amen. Amen. Offerings are becoming of joy here. The give and the excitement, you know, is becoming regular. And I think it's another rescue in the evangelical church. I want to thank the Lord for the privilege of well, the rest of the pastors and giving to this sewage system, which must be hooked up by August the 8th for us to meet our deadline. We're not supposed to have to pay this out, but something happened. Now we're having to pay it. God will help us as we respond in Christ's name. Amen.
Brother Gary Wilson, is he with us tonight? Praise the Lord. Gary, before Jeannie sings and I share a portion of Scripture concerning compromise in Egypt, um, would you come and share about your trip to find your brother? You remember that you remember he was with us not long ago and he was going to... Uh, uh, find his brother after all these years. God did a miracle, so I thought maybe he'd come. Then he's got some pictures I'd like to pass around to the audience and while he's uh, telling this, because, praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> Just, uh, how, how many years has it been, Gary? Yeah, it's been better than 28 years. Better than 28 years, and you knew you had a brother. About 11 years ago, yeah. About 11 years ago, and you've searched for him all that time. Eyes have been open, tried to find him. Would you give the background of that? Because not everybody heard you talk the first time. And while he's doing this, here's what I'd like for you to do. There, he's in every one of them, isn't he? Yes. All right. We'll take them to one, two, three, four. Take them to uh, four sections. And you can see he's with his brother in four different pictures. And then a section can pass over Mac so that while he's talking, they can see he's with his precious brother there, and it's, it's really wonderful. Would you give a little background and then tell what took place? Uh, when I was about a year, year and a half old, uh, we got separated. For some reason, my mother, I guess, couldn't keep me for economics or something, so the Wilsons took care of me. And uh, when I was about 18 years old, they finally mentioned that uh, they had taken care of me. You know, I thought something was, was different, but uh, then I found out for sure that they weren't my real parents. All that uh, my mother could remember was that I had a brother. She couldn't remember her name or anything like that, so I started looking. Went to Grand Rapids, Michigan, about uh, 45 minutes away. So all this time I lived 45 minutes from my brother and never knew it. Uh, found my birth certificate and found my marriage, uh, my parents' marriage license and that, but I couldn't find his uh, certificate. So I kept looking and uh, had a lawyer friend look, and uh, he found his name and some other records and so forth through a newspaper article 
uh, I made a long distance telephone call and uh, talked to an elderly lady that uh, was not my grandmother. And then Karen said, wait a minute, let me try it. And she called and we got the very same operator. And we got the very same number and we said, no, that's not the right number. And then uh, for some reason, which is only the work of, of Jesus, there's no doubt about that, that uh, the operator said, wait a minute. And she went to uh, a different telephone book, as far as we can gather, because it's about 60 miles away from Grand Rapids, and gave us another number. And I called that, and that was my grandmother. And so it's the first time I had talked to her in about 20 years. And so then I uh, talked to her, and she gave me my brother's name, and his name was changed to hers after my mother was killed. And uh, so he went by, you know, his, his grandmother's name. So that's the reason I never found him. So then I talked to him, and he was in a state of shock, you know, and that he wants to find out you've got some relation and not, and not knowing, you know, if, if he's a millionaire, if he's a bum, or if you'd like each other, I called him and, you know, and we talked and, and found out that we had a lot of little things in common, you know, because he was raised by other people than, you know, my real mother and father. So our backgrounds were completely different. And I got about five miles probably from his house, and that's when it hit me. You know, I was really starting getting nervous, sweating, and so forth. And I didn't know what I was going to say. So when we got there, I just put my hand out and said, "Hi, big brother." You know, and we hugged, and it was quite an experience. And uh, got to spend about a day and a half with him and talk to him. And he's coming down about a month, and he wants to see everybody here. And oh. you know, the great thing is that they love Jesus. Oh. And so that's that's a great feeling. Okay. He knew that he had a brother. Uh, he didn't know my name. Uh, he didn't want to get a hold of me if he could have because he didn't know, you know, if I knew. But after I had called him on the phone that first time I've talked to him for so long, I didn't give him my last name. I just told him I lived by Charleston. And so they said he spent about a week up to 1, 2 o'clock at night getting hold of my real mother's friends and so forth, trying to find out what my last name was and everything. And after the initial state of shock, you know, of me calling him that, we've been calling back and forth quite a bit. So he wants me to move back to Michigan. I says, no, I'm supposed to be here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Oh, it's so good. Be sure he gets all these pictures back. Mac, would you be sure that after they're viewed in the, this section here, get to see them? It's such a wonderful story, isn't it? It's such a thrilling thing. And uh, we've been rejoicing about this. And we're real thankful, and I think, don't we all look forward to meeting his brother? It'll be a special time, by God's grace. All right, before I share from God, is there anything on anyone's heart by way of testimony? Yes, if, microphone, thank you, GB, right here, Brother White. Sir. I'm glad you asked that question. God was working in my heart before, Pastor, when you was turning around there talking to Steve. Yes, sir. I am going to need help in this decade. Yes, sir. If I make it. Yes, yeah. I know it. Yes, sir. Because I'm weak. Yes, sir. And I know that I'm going to need help or I'll turn away from God, and I know what's that. Yeah, well, God's going to help you, Jim. So I hope that people remember when they pray. It's good, Jim. Because I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. When, Holy, when he speaks this way, the Holy Spirit says he's with him. <laughs> Isn't this wonderful? Yeah. You see, I, I can tell by his brokenness that, that the victory's, he's already on his way to victory. Amen. I can tell by his brokenness he's already Amen. on his way. You see, the man you're looking at here, I've loved and admired since the first time I ever met him and saw him. And uh, Jim's had his share of battles like everybody else, but he's got a golden heart, and that's all I've been able to see. When I tell you he's got a golden heart, the Holy Spirit said he has a golden heart. Yeah. Yeah. Devil. I'm going over and I'm filing for divorce. Yeah. I'm ready to leave her. Yeah. She's one of the finest women of the earth, of course, and you know that. You You've told me that yourself. You don't know how. 
Yeah, well, I sure believe you, that's for sure. <laughs> I know something about her because of you, and I know something about her because of your children, and uh, the, what I feel from them. They're believers. They're believers of the Word of God. And there's a, there's a beauty about them that's rare, very wonderful. So I'm, I'm quite delighted. I'm quite, I'm quite thrilled with your brokenness, Jim. I really am. And um, I'm so glad the Holy Spirit operates that he's with him. Because this attitude of, of uh, if God didn't help me, I'll turn away from him is a true attitude. If we're not broken. We're going to do exactly that. All of us would be do well to have such an attitude unless God helps us. The pressures of the time. See, the devil tells us that God's not with us. If we lose home or we lose income to the point that we don't have enough to buy bread, have to trust. But you see, Elijah didn't give up because he had to go down by the brook. He was faithful to God, but the religious folk ran him out of the country. Run him clear out. He was faithful to God. But it didn't, but the religious folk weren't, and God had to put him down by the brook. Had to be fed by the raven. I know Elijah did get discouraged one time. Uh, Jezebel put a fright into him. Some way or another, his weakness surfaced, and off he took for the south, you know, and got down in a place. After he had won the victory over 450 prophets of Baal, and they were all slain. At the same time, after a great victory, sometimes a moment of greatest defeats after the, after the greatest victory because we're all very human. But uh, I thought we'd just pray a little prayer that, that God would strengthen that we can take this seriously because we'll have to bear one another's burdens and pray for each other in the days that are ahead. But we want to pray for Jim, that God would grant him grace. I, I just am so thrilled that in spite of the terrible fighting of Satan, that um, Jesus helped me to be able to see his heart when he came, along with others who came from Racine, and not to, not to pay attention to the battle, but just to, be, just to watch the man's heart. Because, and see that, you're all very precious to me, because if you'll let me do that, I can encourage people. Yes. Because I'm, Jesus gives me an eye for seeing them like he sees them to a measure. And, then, and, and that's a connecting link that helps pulls us, help pulls us through. Because what I'm looking at is what you're really like. Not the battle or the upset. Nor what the devil, cause, the failures the devil causes us to be. I don't look at that. I go by what I see in the Spirit. What I know you're really like. And if you know I know you're like that, you respond to that. Because you, that we respond to the best that's within us. If God loves us and trusts us, when God loves us, we respond to that love. If the message gets through, and uh, the only restriction is placed upon me is when persons speak to me and say, well, I don't know why you talk to that person like that. They acted terrible before they got to church. Well, when you do that, then I have two things to think about. Because I know that the next time God deals with me about that person, they may have acted bad. And this is not Jim didn't act bad before he started church. If he did, I don't think bad. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about cases in the background. I've had enough people speak to me about either a wife or a husband or a relative until it's made it very difficult on me. And uh, because if I speak, they don't understand why. They don't understand that I'm going by a call of God within them by a certain thing within them that they may have acted not so good during the week or before they ever came to church and a lot of you get into that. That's all too wholesale. It's not excusing that. I preach hard on how to act. But in a service, if God deals with me through the Shekinah or through what's in your heart, if you'll let me go by that not tell me about each other, then I'm free. But then if you tell me about a certain thing, then I'm limited because immediately when I try to help that person, I think of your warning. Because I don't want you to think I'm a hypocrite or for the devil to fight you that I don't know what I'm talking about. Do you, do you does this register with you? See, and I've had a lot of warnings through the years. I've had a lot of warnings. And if you've warned me, 
And you may, need not feel personal because I've had a lot of warnings. I don't understand why you do this. So and so doesn't act right. Well, I don't really need to know that. Uh, except in very narrow circumstances where I'm, where I'm called in to try to really help in a situation. But as far as just report, I don't need to know that. And if I really don't need to know it, I mean, I'd rather not know it at all. Because then I can operate. By what the, This is what upsets people with Brother Ham. They can't figure out how in the world God will witness for somebody that's saying what they know that things aren't quite right. But the truth of the matter is, you and I do a whole lot of judging on the outside. And God doesn't judge that way. He judges here. You say, well, why did, was there this and that and the other? What you don't realize is that your judgment is worse than the upheaval that went on the other person. And we've never gotten as religious people. We've never gotten that the judgment that we've made against somebody is worse than the upheaval, the, the lack of Christian life that the other person didn't live, be they relative, church member, or whatever. And so we've been unfair, we've been unkind, and we don't know it. So what it does, it puts me in a straitjacket because I care about you, and it's not that you're wrong. Certain behavior should not be. But two things are at hand. One, then I'm limited in terms of helping the person, though I try to press through and do it anyway. Secondly, what we don't realize is that our judgment is worse than the behavior, what, that, that we're, our judgment is worse than behavior judged. It's the case of the elder brother. The truth of the matter is the prodigal son acted terrible. The truth of the matter is there was merit to the elder brother being faithful. But because of God and His great mercy, He's like a parent, like all of you would be. If a son's out in sin and he comes home, you're going to rejoice about it and do the equivalent of killing the fatted calf. Get the robe and get the ring. And you know that there's merit to the brother staying home. But there's no merit in his attitude. His attitude forfeits any good that his staying home might have done. The, the control that he may have had the culture he may have had, the grace that he may have had that he was born with. And I've really tried to work with this through the years because now the reports after all these years are multiple. And the reason I'm saying this, the reason I'm clear to talk with Jim is because nobody's come to me and said anything with reference to Jim. Jim's opened up and told of a battle he had. Well, what if somebody come and said to me now, you don't need to be recognizing Jim. You don't need to be fellowshipping Jim. You don't need to be because there's a battle going on. Well, that, God doesn't deal with you that way. Why should you ask me to deal with someone else that way? And essentially, that's what you're asking me to do. And yet, the truth of the matter be known, God has had mercy, so great mercy on your soul. You don't know it. You don't know how merciful He's been to you till the judgment comes. Nor do you know the wickedness of your own sin. Because where somebody's sin may be in this area, your sin is in another area. Yes, sir. Maybe more cultivated and maybe more civilized, but just as worse or worse. Yes, sir. Yet the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has had mercy on you and had mercy on me. Let us be merciful to one another. Amen. Forgive us, O Lord, of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Yes. This is the Christian church. And it's not, diff it's not easy after 11 years to talk like this. It's not easy. In the, old, in the old days, when I didn't know as much, I could, you know. <laughs> because people really do not know. People really do not know. When I get along this line, I had enough reports through the years that it's no longer personal. They still think it's personal. And if it was, it's still good. Because you know me well enough by now to know that I love you enough not to be personal. Therefore, you shouldn't accuse me of it. 
nor let the devil buffet you that I'm like that. By God's grace, it's just so unfair to me, you see. Now what I'm doing now is taking a poke at the devil because you followed my logic, you just help get him off your head. And it helps us by God's wonderful grace. Ruth has something on her heart. Oh, it's fine. Oh, it's fine. Yes, would you speak so we can hear you? Oh, we, we just have, we just learned so much. Jesus just helps us so preciously. Uh, Ruth, I wanted to ask you if, if a sharing like this, could you give her a little more? Is, there, is that it? Okay. Uh, uh, I was thinking this, Ruth, that I'm not sure that you've had any background for this, but in the early Christian church and in, in the times of Wesley, by God's grace, there were moments that took place like this where an, an exhortation from the spiritual leader or from a lay leader would be, uh, would be so uplifting and helpful, would give us light on a particular subject by His grace. I have gone into such detail on my life a lot of times. That's all beside the point now. I am here mainly and only to praise the Lord and to thank Him for saving my soul, to thank Him for sending me to Scott Depot, to thank Him for Rodney Dunn, to thank Him for you, Pastor Hope, for helping me to open my heart and see that I am a sinner. Thank you, Jesus. And for helping me to turn my life over to Him. Praise the Lord. Uh, the hymns, the song tonight, Stephen, uh, spoke to me, every word of it, because He has carried me safely through the night, and I've been in a long night. Uh, I'm still probably in it, but I'm not as aware of it because the joy is beginning to come. Uh, I don't mean all the problems are over. They're not. I've got more than I ever had before. <laughs> but somehow... Uh, they're just not that important anymore. And I know that Jesus will work it out. Yes. He's become a personal friend to me. Oh, yes. I'm not alone anymore, and I'm thankful for that. Praise God. Uh, I hate to think that I would have lived, if I lived that many years, another 40 years, and just gone on the way I was. Uh, I was so dead. Uh, I'm just thankful. Man. And I think it's time I started saying so. <laughs> it's time. But God's wonderful grace. The Lord checked me. You see, the Lord checked me. I started calling for Jeannie, but he checked me. And look what came out of it. Look, our, our concern here, our, his concern, his wonderful prayer. We want to pray. To have a little prayer together and ask the Lord to fortify and strengthen and Jeannie will come and sing and I have a little sharing that... It's, it's not much, but it may be more than we think, maybe more than I think, and could be entitled Compromise in Egypt, and it has to do with our children. So uh, I'm trusting God to help me in a few moments. By the way, in the time I've spoke to you, I've not seen one scowly face. It, you know, when I get along a certain line, I'm almost afraid to look because the devil fights or says things, but it's so wonderful that in all my a sharing like this is close yes. and it's needful and then Ruth responds the way she does and that lifts us helps us so much but I'm very thankful because when I speak like this there is a certain battle with the powers of the air and but see you help that to lift so that we're clear and I'm so grateful I did I have spoken in the last 48 hours and said that I cannot but be amazed. I just cannot be amazed that if you if you really claim salvation, why that the more you learn about each other, why it doesn't draw you closer to each other rather than push you farther apart. I know that it's carnality and it's of the earth. It's like a little, you know, it's like a, a, a new girl or boy. Remember how they come into school? I'd move in, you know. In some places, I'd be the big shot for two months until they found out I was just like they were. And then I lost my crown. You know, even as short as I am, sometimes all the girls would think I was the best-looking fella in the place. And I could, 
fortunately, I didn't respond much to that. But if, if I wanted to, I'd ride high on that a while. But I remember in the fifth grade, a blonde-headed girl by Joyce Atwell. I even, I just now right now, her name came right back. Joyce came to town in the fifth grade. And Joyce uh, was very pretty. And she came sailing in the fifth grade. And uh, boy, all the guys were, you know, they were all interested in Joyce. But wouldn't you know it? Uh, Jimmy Leslie, who got all the best girls anyway, <laughs> dropped the one he had and went after Joyce. <laughs> Jimmy was, a, a, was from a rich family, and I wasn't, but Jimmy and I were the closest of friends. And, uh, but, but now Joyce didn't interest me, but I observed this observation. I, I thought she was pretty. And I... Uh, and I thought she was new, but somehow, even in the fifth grade, I knew that wasn't quite right. But all the other girls were nothing, and Joyce was everything to the whole flock of boys. Well, she was that way for a while, and then Jimmy dropped.